we'll start with main takeaways because you know what if it's not interesting then you just like go and listen to somebody else but we believe it's pretty cool we'll then we'll go to the big why so like why we even started all of that and then we'll go into three waves of agile transformation and who knows org topologies you see this is really good because they just started we are going to use org topologies to describe what we've been through because we were looking for something elegant and simple and nice to describe it all and that was the thing so like we can applause to Roland and Krivitsky who is giving the talk because they are the authors and they're here it's such a pleasure it's like -hoo -hoo -hoo. thank you Roland <laughs> um oh just a second uh, yeah, the wrong click and then we'll go into lessons learned so, like we've been through three waves um, and I think we are good to go, right? Of course, always. Okay, so the main and the biggest takeaway that I haven't seen in many other countries is how um, the leadership had the guts, I also hear the echo, to actually flip it all and to have this leap of faith. So like they say we do agile and they didn't just talk, but they actually did. Fully fledged, agile transformation, no question asked. And here we are now, where we are. <laughs> so I think uh, <laughs> you meant in many other companies. We're not, you know, countries. Maybe I don't know. Did I say countries? Yeah, you said countries, but that's fine. We don't, uh, we don't uh, think we're unique uh, in the universe. And that's maybe the difference um, uh, of uh, the intro. If you're not only manager, but basically an entrepreneur. There is not so many people who can hold you back or you are, you know, accountable towards, but yourself and your people. And um, so guts is something natural. I mean, we're in a daily competition with the outside world, so we always have to, you know, take some decisions. It, uh, I think it was perceived also looking back courageous, but back then it didn't feel like that. It felt pretty normal. Nevertheless... These kind of things, um, if you, you take entire pieces of the organization, and back then there were a bunch of people, um, something about 100 or so, Lucy knows better, of course, um, affected. And looking at the so the underlying challenge with the entire tech and business continuity, you needed to have some sponsorship because you cannot at that point in time you know, call out some of the people, some of the employees, and take, like, you, make yourself responsible for that and... If not, I fire you. I think that would not have been a very positive fuel. So um, I, I was the sponsor not only because I'm the tech in the founding team. What drives me more until today is, you know, bringing people together, working with people. The tech thing is just, you know, I got my first computer with five, standard story. Um, but what drives me more is working with people. So that was easy. What wasn't that easy back then is as a fast-growing company, we were backed by venture capitalists and private equity. And they put hundreds of millions at the table and they were like, okay, what are you doing? You're just flipping around an organization and then it's all different and you have no real idea what happens if it doesn't work. So um, we really started off with uh, taking them, you know, pre our journey and explaining why we do that and you know, what agile means and that kind of stuff. So I had at least an understanding, and it was not a remaining unknown, unknown. They've read in books and stuff, but something they could, you know, was became more tangible to them. And um, with the ultimate go, well, um, we just started. Mm -hmm. Are we good? Okay. <laughs> and that's where it all began. So the reason we basically got where we had been back then was... There were many companies down there. 10 years ago when Flix was founded, uh, we were not the only one. Um, and um, in competition, it turned out that there were two successful startups in Germany with a joint vision, but different strength. And um, over the time when we started and we created the first you know, piece of technology in different ways and um, basically compete each other, at some point, we thought it's smarter to bring the startups together to not eventually lose against the incumbents. And when we did so, well, that was kind of the nucleus of um, what we're talking about today later, because we had two teams, two systems, two organizations, and well, we brought it together, but that didn't mean back then, you know, it just 
works out directly, but there was work to do. And uh, what we didn't know back then is how we were able to tackle. So we, in 2015, had a functioning system, but it seemed not to be scalable. I'm saying at all, but you know, to a certain extent. Mm -hmm. And by saying to startups, we mean Mindfairbus and Flixbus, and the, the startups were very culturally different, as you were saying and hinting and mentioning, but yeah, the same idea, so we're... And the, like, the main thing that we're, we would like you to, um, to get from this presentation is in, in the cases of really good um, transformations and when um, management goes fully fledged into um, you know, keeping up with the times, um, tech sometimes becomes not a limiting but enabling factor. And we have seen how it was keeping up with coming from three countries to 40 countries now, expansions where Flixbus is driving, right? Yeah, 41. 41, so and th this is insane. Like if I was told in 2017 that we would be 40 countries, I was like, no way. But, yeah. <laughs> back, then, back then, you know, it just worked, but it took us forever to ship an app. It took us forever to adjust almost anything. We had a so-called meta sprint process where in almost every team, they were like, yeah, we understand the requirement, but we're dependent on this, that, here, and whatever, and well, it takes forever. And, and that obviously uh, we didn't want to accept. And I guess if we now fast forward to today, it took us less than one year to rip off the entire technology platform, which was older than 30 years at Greyhound, and flip the almost $1 billion company onto our platform. So that would not have been close to possible in 2015. And that's only partly true because of AWS cloud architectural topics. It is more true about you know what the organization looked like, the technology organization back in 2015 and how it looks today. Mm -hmm. Right, and but where it all started, right? The first wave, just right after the merge, there were still two companies and there was so much ahead of us, right? So what if you cover us the Flixbus part? So what is still true for uh, the three co-founders on the Flix side is we're a little bit hyper-aggressive. We love competition and we're super fast. So that meant on that edges, marketing, you know, raising money, um, business perspective, that was what we were at the core. But um, from a technology point of view, it lagged a bit behind. And uh, when we started late, we decided to, well, it, we were first to decide to pick up external dependencies, purchase software, just not because it was a proper make or buy, it was just we were too late to implement something ourselves. And um, that made us a bit vulnerable because we were dependent on the one hand. And on the other hand, there was Mindframbus. Yes, and Mindframbus was really strong, a technical part, like they were a very technically driven company and um, they had really cool technical, um, you know, skilled people. And one of the things that I think was brilliant, they never had manual testers, like never, ever. So like all of the testers that they have were automated ones, so they could read the code, could understand it. And they also had not just full stack devs, but also one designer and two front end developers who actually are still with the company. So they are <laughs> the core, the core, the core of the team. And the, the main challenge was actually how do we bring those people together? Because uh, very business oriented teams and very technically driven teams, they have different um, mentality and they have different mindsets, but we had the same aim. There was one funny situation some of the oldies uh, remember. I used to work for Microsoft prior. And as one of the co-founders, I, I became the part in the management team who was heading or meant to head technology, but we had a very skilled CTO. Um, and I know that all the Manfrenbus people at that point in time, they thought, okay, now that, that dude comes in and we were going to switch everything to Microsoft and eventually outsource everything. But during the due diligence of that deal, I recognized what my friend was built was much more powerful. And obviously the fixed people were closer to myself because I all hired them. So I took the call and said like, we're throwing away whatever Flix built and go with the my friend was platform, which in the core is still running. Um, and I think that was 
part of the foundation to also, you know, win the hearts of the entire team to move on with that journey. Because um, the trust with the former Flixies was there already. And I think I gained some trust when I came in and threw away what I was originally in charge of and chose what was better, independent of personal biases or ego stuff. And um, yeah, then we continued. Yes, and that was totally brilliant. And we also had a little bit of difference in my variables because there were two offices. There was Berlin and Kharkiv, and every time we were saying Munich, we meant you know Flixbus guys. And every time we were saying Berlin, we meant actually Ukrainian and um, you know Berlin guys because that was the other part. Okay, and when we were trying to analyze according to org topologies, where there are two dimensions and the um, the horizontal dimension is how skilled the people were in one team to ship the product. And on vertical dimension, it's how well they knew the product. We realized that, you know, mainly, especially in manufacturing, they were functional groups doing tasks. Because in Flixbus, there were some scrum teams already with some product owners. So the mindset was there, but the setup was not quite. No. <laughs> Well, the mindset agile, you know, is still there. So uh, the topo topology stuff wasn't there back then. Of and course, as Previtsky <laughs> was part of the show. Maybe there is part of uh, underlying thoughts um, where he supported us building where we are. So that was the starting point, and then we had two more waves to go. Let's go further. So, like, why? Why did we need to start all of that? I mean, we we literally. We were lagging behind in business. The hypothesis of bringing the companies together was to become market leader quickly in Germany and not to burn that much money. But that meant to unite not only the systems, but also, you know, doing something about combining the inventory, you know, really making sure the customers uh, are being appealed more. That took us longer and really, um, you know, brought the company to one of the situations where um, we had to do something about it. And uh, we had a bunch of initiatives to fix that, but the initiatives always were stopped because of the gravitation of what was there. And um, at the end, we started to uh, you know, talk with outsiders we brought in, we thought had experience. Alexei Grubitsky was one, Greg was one, a bunch of others, Ari. Um, and um, well, then we thought it's a good idea to adjust the organization first and the rest will come by itself. And it doesn't come by itself itself, but it at least um, it gives a leeway that you can do the actual tasks later. Yes, and the core thing that we were taking into account was the Conway's law. Organizations which design systems are constrained to produce designs which are copies of the communication structures of these organizations. So whatever structures we change, then the change, whatever structures we you know, make, they will define the communication that will be in the company and they will define the products that we are going to produce. And I, th I think that was the key thing why the change stuck, actually. Why it was not rolled back, why it didn't you know, change when the people left the company or some new people came, because it was just the default thing already. Yeah, exactly. And if you look at transparency and frequent delivery, I mean, in many companies, there's quite some cost towards the tech team. And other sea levels, the business folks are like, what the fuck? It's always, you know, being delayed further and getting more expensive. I don't get it. Um, and then you really waste time in order to re-explain. And, you know, just uh, that obviously, among others, is also hurting productivity. But apparently back then we were also only able to ship <laughs> once a month or so. Um, just we couldn't do more and we couldn't also do anything in parallel. And... Over time, you know, that's not sustainable. And, um, you know, altogether, well, um, we decided to do something about it. Mm -hmm. And, you know, like I interviewed people before, um, you know, trying to remember because that was so many years ago. And these are the things that they were quoting. You can just look through them really quickly. And unfortunately, we had the things like one-year-old attempt to release a new website, and then it <laughs> failed. Well, yeah, unfortunately, things didn't get shipped all the time. And then, yeah, build ugly, but functional, and you know, stuff like that. You know, there's so many anecdotes where um, 
business folks came directly also to engineers and said, like, this is what I want. It's easier. I can do it in Excel. <laughs> but that doesn't mean that it scales, A. And B, nobody took care about whether an engineer properly understood. And then, you know, you all know that if someone is looking for a swing and at the end gets something different, that happened relatively regular. Um, you know, it was okay. So we were able to run the business. But also... Because at that point in time, at least in Germany, we didn't have too much competition left. And with cheap prices, we could fuel our growth. But at the end, if you want to become sustainable, you cannot give tickets away for free. Um, and um, so another bunch of reasons. And, uh, you know, all of those people are still with the company. And uh, that's funny. I mean, we just, we just were very much um, trial and erroring for quite a while. Um, and that also led to, if you remember one of the initial slides, to the scut, because you get frustrated if you have been trying forever and it doesn't change. You either stop or, you know, you do something which is more common. We had people who said like, hey, how about introducing that process, this layer here and there and blah. Or you look more on the entire system and just change it completely. Um, and that that was what we went for. Just apparently. one small anecdote. When I joined, I remember there was the team to where the stakeholders were coming directly and the team was saying like, we want to release that. And they're like, no, 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 wait, wait, just a second. We want this feature more. And then we want this feature more and they never released it then. So that was like so brilliant. Um, okay, and then after all of that, we went into the second wave. And it was where we were moving from functional group to in task to autonomous team with feature focus. And that is totally different structurally organization. Um, I think if you flip one slide, is that then coming to Before? Next? Ne next. Next, okay. Ah, uh, no, go back. So um, <laughs> what we, uh, the one you were uh, on, you were on. This one? Yeah, so. Okay. Of course, you know, when we wanted to technically decouple, that doesn't go overnight. And um, so we needed to understand first that requirements engineering matters much more than people think. And, and I actually knew that from my career in automotive, but uh, uh, that was clearly defined in these waterfall kind of things. And um, people didn't understand too well with, you know, what the role of a product owner was and these kind of things. So we really... We almost started with, you know, scrum sessions, agile coaches, management 3.0 workshops to a bit get the glimpse across. Um, and obviously that only was, um, you know, within the feature focus because there was not so much lying around, but still having the understanding of, you know, owning even features end to end was something which we, which we had to lie uh, to kind of, you know, give a certain foundation to start with. I remember when we discussed whether we would go more with Scrum or with Kanban or with whatever, people were like, hey, super flexible, it's agile, we can do everything. And I had to enforce Scrum, not because I love Scrum, I care, I don't care about whatever. But you know, if you want to freestyle, you better get your fundamentals right first, so you get to know what you're talking about. And, um, and there we had quite some discussions because they were like, Scrum, you know, that's not us, we need more blah, blah. And I'm like, fair enough. But you first learn to walk, and then we talk about running. Um, and that was, I guess, important also because it seemed to function and people seemed to pick up, which gave us the freedom in the organization, but also with the stakeholders, C-level supervisory board, that we moved on with the journey. Mm -hmm. And yeah, so we were doing the wave two, but in parallel, you were already planning wave three. So you really had the vision of the things that should be coming. And I, and I think that was also the fascinating thing. Um, what we apparently did in parallel first was we were not working only on the organization, but we also tried to understand how we have to cut that elephant in pieces. So that kind of monolith. And there are different approaches. You can do value stream approach, you can do a bunch of things, and we ended up in a domain-driven design approach from a technical point of view. And what caught me back then is that context switches for engineers are very painful and you lose time. 
because it's creativity, you have to familiarize, and it's not about the programming. And, um, and even though I would have loved to do value stream because it's alongside the customer, the rest of the company, they didn't get the concept yet. So I could not have forced them. But what the rest of the company was, was clearly structured. There was a marketing department, a finance department, a customer service department, all those structures. And that helped to cut the technical elephant in pieces. And yeah, I thought um, if it's technically structured like that, we eventually we align us as a tech organization and the software on the business side. So we mirror them. So they understand what their techies are talking about and the techies eventually have a kind of a contained context. So they familiarize also with the business more and are not all over the place. And well, initially that didn't resonate too well because it was perceived as an additional structure, which it is not necessarily a hierarchy. So people were still, you know, thinking about Scrum and becoming more autonomous. And I uh, came across with, you know, we need already more structure because it needs to scale. And well, that was lots of talking and convincing and discussing. So at the end, I'm not sure if I thought already what the result was like, but I had an idea which I wanted people to think about. So what I still do, um, I try to, plant some seeds and if they grow and people come back with you know the grown-up plant you know owning them as their child thought, child of thought that's fine i just smile and uh, uh, uh you know I'm really lucky because at the end it's not it's enough to plant some seeds and you eventually harvest the value afterwards but people really you know make it grow and and um, fill it with life and that worked out after hundreds of talks um, but uh, it is still present so that's still how we work and back then we were as I said about 100 people or so and meanwhile it's 500 people mm -hmm. and I think we can go to the next slide right so the structure that we learned it with after the first after the flick stack 1.0 so that is the second wave was this we had product owners agile coaches and people managers yeah, so I think the coaches were important on two things on the organizational level to make sure, you know, we keep on thinking and discussing what we, um, what we laid out, Lucy and myself, um, and also on a team level to really make sure, you know, almost like scrum mastering to, that the people understand what the ceremonies were and how that works and that, you know, storming, you know, forming, norming, that these kind of things happen because we grew a lot. I mean, from 100 to 500 new people come in, old people go out. Product owners were clear. Even though we had product managers, it was important to us to change that little thing because managing and owning, this is kind of like the intro. I'm not only a manager, I'm also partly an owner of the company. And for people managers, we currently meanwhile engineering people managers because they need a little bit more context so they work with engineers, but apparently what they still do is they manage you know, the organization. So while the rest of the crew, whether it's the engineers, the product owners, all the agile uh, coaches, they they kind of like um, talk about how things were done, um, that the production facility as that kind of the teams, the domains work well and very efficient and very healthy. That's something uh, those PMs take care about. Okay. I think we need to get a little bit yeah. quicker because we have That's 15 fine. minutes. So, and in 18 months of changes, we had flat hierarchy, team self-design event, and then Flix Ignition. Oh, we had chapters and communities, Hacker Days, Flix Labs, OKRs, Living Style Guide, Flix Tech Summit, and frankly, that was We too did everything. Much. <laughs> yes, we, we did, did everything. everything. Um, and we all stopped quite a bit. All of the buzzwords, yeah. yeah we, all, all of the buzzwords. Um, <laughs> and, and we wasted tons of money, OKRs, in, out, didn't fit. So. What we learned over time is, if it's on the books, if Spotify did it, if you know, even your book, fine, but you have to make sure it fits your need. And uh, I think that's what we ended up with. So in the end, all of the things that we introduced in the later stage, like OKRs, and then I can't remember, there was something else. Um, yeah, Flix Tech Summit, they just died because you know, like when you introduce too many changes, people just can't really do them very well. 
Okay, I think... One example, and yeah. that's very quick, is we had a bunch of chapters because that was back then super cutting edge shit, Spotify. And people were lost. They were like, okay, this is my work and then I have to do chapter work and at the end, fuck's sake. So we, there is only one chapter left, which is our Flix architecture board. It's, you know, the principles making sure in terms of technical housekeeping, the rest on a lightweight community level, fair enough. But uh, that just, it was too much. And that was really people where, that was funny. That's an important anecdote. Everybody was wishing for more autonomy, less hierarchy. When we changed that, that was the first moment in time where we had at FlixTech churn. We barely had any churn before. And after the change, people left. And I was like, what the fuck? I exactly delivered what you were asking for. But, you know, if a tiger is born in prison, the tiger knows eventually that this is not where he belongs to. And if he convinces, you know, the caretaker to release, well, he momentarily might be happy, but that die because of not being able to hunt food. And we just forgot to train the people how to hunt food. <laughs> so they died in terms of resigned. And just the numbers wise, we started with 19 chapters and then we ended with one, you know, so like that's how, <laughs> how badly this thing was, was shrinking. And yeah, there was the team self design event that was pretty cool because we flipped all of the Flick stack in one day. We were preparing that for six months and then in the end we realized that we actually changed the company but we don't know what to do next. <laughs> so in two nights we created, so that was the team self design event and in two nights we created Flix Ignition. So that was I think the, <laughs> the quickest creation of anything um, in, in Flix, just like the process wise and it turned really well. The important is even the way we did it was a little bit agile, not on purpose, just because we didn't know. Um, and that also is back to the guts topic because we planned that one thing. We had selected a bunch of people who were volunteer for product owners. They pitched and the entire team by itself redesigned how the teams are supposed to look like. The management didn't do so much. And, um, and my, only, you know, my only concern was business continuity, but it worked. And there was no not invented here syndrome or you know some of the psychological pattern because they all choose their own, you know their own next journey, their their faith basically. At the end, it was done, and there was a middle, a little bit of a gap missing. You have the organization, you know how the future the architecture is supposed to look like. How do you get there? Um, and that was what Lucy was mentioning, Flix Ignition. We, we only came off, up with it after a couple of weeks because we were like, okay, no, it's all the ingredients are there. So why doesn't nobody start <laughs> cooking? Because we eventually, there was no, you know, no proper pots and pans. That's what we forgot to bring to the party. Yeah, and the main aim was to split the monolith into self-contained systems. But we, in, in six months of preparation, we didn't think like, how do we start the infrastructure change? And the Flix Ignition period, like in one month we did, and there was the... Uh, the blueprint for the other team. There were four pilot teams that were doing that, and in a month they gave the blueprint of how other teams could do that. So that was really massive, nice experiment. Okay, I think we can miss that. And then this is the this is the beauty of um, getting of of the second wave, the design system. Do you remember how that all started? The workshop. No. Yeah, the workshop, I remember. There was the workshop and we were thinking, should we get another monolith for the front end? You know, so all of the teams look alike, you know, everything looks alike. But then we thought, no, we don't want the monolith. We want something else. And then there were these guys, Christopher Pancic, Andrew Lincoy, and I think someone else. And they were saying, I think design system would be a nice way in. And that was, that was something they were doing for a year and a half. And it turns out to be very valuable because then you can buy a different company and can just recolor them quickly. Like in a month so or uh, year or two. And imagine if we really had the, another layer of monoliths for that. I think that would be a disaster. I think that would, wouldn't be even possible. Eventually. Okay. And That's the structure. That's a quick one. Um, the colors do not matter. So there is not a VP. Uh, uh, or an exec responsible for one of the uh, domains or teams. Um, we just decoupled and made them only lateral leaders. I made them accountable, but they didn't have any disciplinary lead. Only I have. 
And the rest were structures alongside the domains. We meanwhile have 11 domains and I don't know, 50 teams or so. I think so. Um, and uh, yeah, they all have what is needed. Um, you know, POs, QA, um, coaches. And um, the only difference is we only in the meantime converted internal IT into an agile mode. The rest exactly works like that, just larger. Mm -hmm. Right, and these are the domains that we started with, but then unfortunately some of them got dissolved. But that's the way the organization worked with chapters, with, with domains, yeah. I think, with whatever. All of the things that we needed stayed, and I think from the nine here we have seven, right? One of these and new ones, uh, uh, you know, just popped up, that's right. Okay, and in org topology scans we moved like in all of these three steps from functional groups and then to autonomous teams with feature focus and now autonomous teams with product part focus because they are aware of what are the things that are done in every domain and yep. they have an overview of what is done in the whole company like yep. quarterly. Yeah. The only step which is missing that you entirely cross-functionalize together with the business, we tried, um, that could have been way four. I pulled that back. That uh, the maturity isn't there yet. And meanwhile, the entire business with, you know, white color is more than 1,500 people across those 24 offices, and with the blue colors is almost six or seven thousand, and so many cultures. It, it works well, so I may keep on trying, but uh, I, I paused for now. And now lessons learned. We have a bunch, so maybe we're running out of time. There are yeah. only eight minutes left, so I will. I want, come on. <laughs> <laughs> okay, let, let's leave it this. So, I so there's one, there, some things are very obvious. You know, the business continuity, we are not in a free world, so it's important that someone pays for the show and uh, people understood that matters. Um, we didn't have a proper retrospective culture. Many people talk about error culture or failure culture. Meanwhile, that works. So there is no blaming. People really, you know, sit together and figure out what the root cause was, was and try to solve that. And with that, we also introduced postmortem culture in yeah, pre-mortem exactly. culture, and I think this was also one of the things. Postmortems, like any incident, we review it, and it's company-wide clear what are the steps to never ever let that let that happen again. And as for pre-mortems, before the big anything, we sit together and we we believe, like we try to foresee it failed disastrously what happened how can we mitigate that even before anything started and i think that was also one of the key things that we didn't have major failures if you look at alignment appreciative thinking uh, shared goals you know that's all what currently is important that the business and the tech folks work together jointly and not against each other and you know they literally they proactively we had yesterday and we'll have today our quarterly roadmap session where all the pos we present their teams, talk about what they achieved the last three months and what they're planning to achieve together with their business folks. In the beginning, there was lots of discussion. Meanwhile, there's 99.9 .9 alignment. There is sometimes many things which just cross cut because, you know, regulatory change or any surprise. But usually this is super, it's just, it's just meant to, everybody is knowing what we're working on. So that's something uh, which uh, I think remains ultimately important, even though it's a lot of effort. There's like hundreds of people for two days blocked. But if you look at the entire organization for a quarter, that's way more expensive if you fuck it up. It's on the roadmap level, but also on the team level, we extended Scrum into Scrum extended teams, inviting literally stakeholders in and saying, you're the part of the team, we have the same goal, how do we get there together? And I think that was also a very strong message. If you look at the last one's time for prep and experiment, I mean, we kept on Flix Labs and really give the freedom that people look outside of their standard product, their standard scope, to keep on innovating. And um, they sit together for the three days every three months in order to create whatever, like they can do whatever. And this was one of the ways how we got this voice, <laughs> voice, not recognition, yeah, but voice yeah, assistant team, yeah, exactly. right? Yeah, exactly. C3PO, yeah. yeah. <laughs> Um, that's the only uh, the only challenge between business and tech teams. The tech teams meant to have random names, and sometimes the business <laughs> teams are like, "What the fuck?" I mean, sure. um, there is one learning not on top of that. That, even though it's been created, doesn't run by itself forever. You have to take care about that. 
it's a living organism. You have to review your learnings and make yourself familiar every other day so you don't forget about them. It has to become part of your kind, your inner system. It has to be like breathing. And that's not easy. I don't believe in such a complex system. It goes by itself. So you regularly have to review and, you know, reflect on that. Mm -hmm. I think we're good. We're done. Yay. Questions. Perfect. <laughs> so much a big applause. Thank you so much. It, it really felt like a, like a conversation between the two of you of, of uh, memories, bringing back memories. Let's, let's ask them. Let's ask them the hard questions. Come on. Here we go. So would you say that, uh, I mean, how, how much external help did you acquire actually to do we that? Had, we had three coaches. There was Alex Zagrevitsky, there was Ari Tika, and there was Greg Hutchinson. Um, some of our internal coaches worked together with them, got, got to know them here in conferences and brought them in because of their different flavor and experience. That's about it. So there were 12 agile coaches in the very beginning, like they were agile coaches and scrum masters and we were with the teams for a couple of years. But we hired them, most of them. Yeah, I mean, internal coaches and three ex external ones, so 15. Um, thanks so much, it was a great talk uh, and I appreciate uh, coming here and taking the time. Um, I, I'm, I like the metaphor, metaphor that you said about uh, Tiger in the cage. Um, I, was, I was wondering, what would you do different um, now about like, I, I, I felt like you said it was a very hard transition from... So sometimes, yeah, sometimes people wish for something like my children because they saw it on TV or they read about it, but they don't really like or they don't need, really know what the consequences are. So having given a little bit more thought about that and not only listen to the wishes, and, you know, they, they want sweets all day long. I mean, I also taught the feed my children with sweets all day long. And back then I, I was a little bit too, hey, if they would wish for, so I give them. Um, I should have thought that through a little bit more. If I would have resolved it or if I would have resolved it differently, I don't know. Because only with a trial, that doesn't work. If it's too little, it's not, you know, to be scaled easily in these kind of... And I could not have trialed with every individual and played through, you know, that kind of game. So, so do you know, know how to hunt? Um, I think I was too naive and wondered for too long why people left. They couldn't, not, they couldn't really tell why they would leave. It's like, we don't have someone anymore who tells us what to do. And like, yeah, that's what you ask for. I'm like, yeah, but it feels unnatural, I quit. So I watched almost half a year. That was too long. Um, I should have reacted quicker. But, you know, the only obvious solution is to kind of do some trialing but i don't think that would have worked it was on purpose that we took that entire thing as one single change so it's not that easy to answer i think i didn't reflect enough on what the consequences would be and i watched too long what the consequences were before i intervened thank you so much before i hand over to the two other men is there a female voice please for a question comment <laughs> no I'm, pressure I'm gonna, no I'm pressure <laughs> i'm gonna stress i'm gonna stressing that all the time <coughs> please yes <laughs> um you have 50 teams about uh how we how you do the cross functional do you adopt less or do you hmm? adopt something so um i think what we do is closer to less than to a framework like safe um well, on a domain level, um, some of the most senior folks became um, domain leads, domain technology officers, domain product officers. They, they run the entire domains consisting of three to maybe 10 teams. Um, and they not only look that the domain runs, but they also sync regularly with the other domains. And also we still have coaches, not as many as back then because the system in general works but at least one coach, sometimes two per domain. And they, you know, if there are new teams formed, they really have to focus on the teams, so they become teams. But usually they look more across um, the domains, so it works together. And then there are a bunch of communities where they work functionally together. So the front-end folks or, um, you know, the product owners itself. Um, so they share their knowledge and their tooling. So we try to not invent uh, our, our wheel twice. But I have to admit, 
with the size we now became, that becomes more complicated. So we already start thinking if we have to adjust um, the system or no, but I'm not conclusive on the solution yet. And I think it's worth also mentioning that agile coaches don't belong to teams now, they belong to yeah, domains, domains and they work with leadership. So like every leadership team has an agile coach to keep on evolving and they're looking in what are the options to evolve better and they're experimenting on their own. So now there are seven, um, say, parallel experiments running. Some of them are similar, some of them are very different. And this is a really cool way to explore how the organization can grow in a safe environment. So it's not just wild and independent, they are all autonomous, but you know, to the limits. Um, you mentioned people manager, coaching and the right team setup, reducing conflicts of interest. Can you please explore this? So if you have a bunch of humans together in a room, conflicts will arise because we have different personalities. And that's the one thing. The other thing is, you know, we're working in some environment, so there's a culture of the company, there are offices, there are things to be taken care of, which um, is not necessarily in the core of the individual to take care about, but it's you know something we have to serve from a company perspective. And last but not least, autonomy become you know it's a balance with accountability, autonomy, accountability. If not, it's chaos. So I still believe I when I want to create a high performance team, it comes also with you know some performance. We don't have a performance management in terms of higher fire or uh, 20, 70, 10, but we look um, that teams work and we do not um, accept you know, individuals cheating the system. And that's something um, which uh, I need a role to take care of, like housekeeper or you know, kindergartner or whatever in some sense. We also call this role, just a second, we also call this role a triage you know, a trial judge in a way, right? So whatever happens, if the team has a conflict or they cannot agree or there is a product owner and the team, you know, that cannot agree to some point, they come to people manager now, engineer and people manager, and he's the mediator. Like he's the person who is as unbiased as possible and he really tries to bring uh, to the light the issue and to really solve it in a as balanced way, in as rightful way as possible. Okay, dears, we need to get on. Thank you so much. But the last one, a very quick one, please. Yep. Uh, this question is, uh, I'm here. Where are you? <laughs> <laughs> uh, the question is related to the, the same topic. Um, I saw that autonomy, mastery, and purpose, and you have attached three different roles to it. Yeah. Um, did you make those three roles responsible for each of those, each of the areas? Partly. So, partly. Responsible, yes. Accountable is the team itself, you know, they have to really buy into the shit. The roles are partly support. So I, I need agile coaches to drive the show so people understand how the systems work. And I make them accountable of driving that. I do not make them accountable that the team pick that up. And, you know, taking the development and learning journey of people, I obviously make the engineering people managers accountable that there's an offer which fits the needs of their teams. But, you know, at the end, learning development, it's an individual choice. So accountable is the, the, the person. And, uh, you know, the POs obviously are accountable that the matchmaking of the requirements and the understanding of the team's work. But if the business wishes for some bullshit product and we create a bullshit product, I cannot call the PO accountable that it's bullshit and doesn't fit the market alone. Thank you.